Well, uh, Les and John, uh, talk about speakers who know their topic well. Les and John are a fine example of that. Uh, let me start with Les Eldridge. Uh, his, he lectures widely in the Puget Sound region on, on maritime history and, and taught that at the college level for 30 years or so. And he's often narrating aboard the steamer Virginia Five and the historic schooner Adventurous. Uh, he's the author of five historical novels on the American Civil War at sea and is co-author of the Wilkes Expedition and Puget Sound of the Oregon Country. He's president of the South Sound Maritime Heritage Association and he chaired the Maritime Committee of the Washington State Centennial Commission, among many other things that I would make too long of a list here, but we're glad to have him. And John Huff, he is a fourth generation Washingtonian, was raised in the Puget Sound region. He's a 25 year plus member of the Olympia Rotary Club and he has a lifetime interest in maritime history. Uh, he's a past president and a longtime board member of the Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society. He's published several articles on regional maritime history, including about Olympia's historic tug Sandman. And he participates in the State Heritage Caucus and the Thurston County Historians Conference. And we are honored to welcome them both to speak about their new Arcadia book, Maritime Olympia in the South Puget Sound. Afterwards, they're selling the books and signing them in the back if you'd like. It, it is holiday gift buying season, so <laughs> take advantage of that. So let's welcome John and, and Les. Thank you, Don. It's uh, a pleasure to be here today. Thank you all for coming out uh, to sit in on this. Basically, uh, what we're going to cover today is maritime history from the first indigenous people to arrive here uh, up through modern times uh, in the port of Olympia. So our story begins about 12,000 years ago when the ice sheet that covered this area began to retreat and the indigenous people moved into the area and they developed a vibrant canoe culture. Uh, they found that trying to hike through the forest uh, was difficult. And if any of you hiked off trail around here, you know what it's like. So they naturally took to the water and developed uh, an amazing skill at building canoes. Uh, typically they would cut down a big cedar tree and then a master canoe carver would spend about a year uh, carving one of these beautiful canoes. And here we have a, uh, the, the peoples in the Puget Sound region are generically referred to as the Coastal Salish people, uh, includes the, our neighbors, the Squaxin tribe and the Squally tribe, the Op tribe and the other tribes in the Puget Sound area. And here we have a family paddling along, uh, I understand this photo was taken off of Stellicum in the late 1800s. And what the, what the Native Americans did was they ha would have a winter village with a sturdy cedar house to keep the rain out. And then in spring and summer, they would go off to summer camps where they would harvest uh, shellfish, fish, uh, berries, roots, and that to sustain them through the the coming winter. So uh, a lot of these canoe photos are families coming and going from their winter quarters to their summer camps. Here we have two women paddling a more workaday canoe. It's a little blunter, faster to make. Uh, you can see they have their household goods in the middle there, the midships. Uh, so they're obviously either coming or going from summer camp. The Native Americans developed sails for their canoes early on. Why paddle if you can sail? Uh, but once uh, the white folks showed up with their trade goods, they adopted uh, cloth sails as opposed to the woven mat sails they had originally developed, a lot easier to work with. And so this family has uh, beached their boat, but you can see their cloth sails there. <coughs> My family nickname is Fumble Thumbs, <laughs> so I, I plead with John to uh, uh, be the person who switches the slides so I don't uh, uh, do any more damage than I usually do. This is uh, a painting of uh, George Vancouver, uh, 
1792. Actually, he sailed uh, on uh, April Fool's Day, 1790, from Great Britain. Uh, he had three lieutenants uh, aboard, and he sailed with actually three ships. Uh, the Chatham uh, was uh, commanded by um, Lieutenant Broughton, and then aboard his ship there were uh, there were three uh, lieutenants. The first lieutenant was Zachariah Mudge. Uh, the second lieutenant was Peter Puget, who we all know by name. And the third, uh, Joseph Baker, uh, for whom Mount Baker is named. Uh, Vancouver was a, an irascible man. And uh, he and First Lieutenant Mudge didn't hit it off too well, which is probably OK, because uh, if he had liked Mudge a lot better and hadn't sent him away on his supply ship early in the expedition, the Daedalus, uh, we might be Mudge Sound. <laughs> Thank heaven for that, although there are there is a Mudge Bay and a mud, Mudge Point up in the uh, Canadian San Juan, so he didn't completely ignore his, uh, his first lieutenant. Uh, Vancouver did note when he sailed on April Fool's Day that one of his uh, uh, three uh, duties on this expedition uh, was to determine uh, whether or not there was an entry to the Northwest Passage uh, anywhere near uh, uh, where he was uh, where he was headed, uh, and he was of course headed to uh, Vancouver Island at Nootka Sound, and he was. Uh, charged with uh, uh, negotiating with the Spanish over possession, who should uh, possess Nootka Sound. Uh, and, uh, um, but he, he did note that the crew was highly amused that one of their jobs was to figure out if there was a Northwest Passage, uh, since a man of the Hudson's Bay Company named Samuel Hearn had uh, about uh, 10 years before, walked all the way from Hudson's Bay uh, to the north shore of, uh, of the North American continent, the, uh, far above the Arctic Circle, proving that there was no Northwest Passage except the one uh, north of our continent, which was, of course, filled with ice. So uh, Vancouver anchored uh, his flagship, the Discovery, um, up near Seattle, and uh, he uh, uh, he told Peter Puget to take uh, two ships' boats south, and he said, "Take five days and chart the entire South Sound." <laughs> now, now, I see there are a lot of sailors <laughs> in the audience uh, smiling at that because you know of all the the coves and and uh, bays in the sound, that would have been impossible. Uh, so he took uh, a ship's boat with uh, uh, this gentleman, uh, Archibald Menzies aboard, who was, uh, uh, had volunteered to be the ship's surgeon, and, but he was a, uh, what is known as a supernumerary. He was not part of the crew, but he was assigned by the prestigious Royal Society, a scientific group, in, uh, in Great Britain to go to collect botanical specimens. Uh, Menzies was a, uh, a physician, uh, but also a botanist and uh, uh, a very, very well-known one. Um, in those days, surgeons aboard uh, Royal Navy vessels were often barbers whose experience was pulling teeth and who might be good with a saw for amputations, and that's about as far as their physician's skills went. And many of them had a little bit of difficulty uh, with alcohol, and the surgeon uh, for Vancouver died uh, from alcoholism while they were rounding Cape Horn. So Menzies, who was aboard as, as the botanist, said, I'll volunteer to take over the uh, surgeon's duties, since there was no other qualified person aboard. So uh, the other commander of the other ship's boat was a man named Joseph Whidbey, who we all know 
<coughs> excuse me, from Whidbey's Island, and uh, he was the navigator. They were called sailing masters in those days. And so the, uh, the two ships' boats with about 15 men sailed south, charted the South Sound. It actually only took them seven days, which is pretty remarkable. But at the fifth day when uh, Puget hadn't reappeared up uh, at the Discovery near Seattle, <clears throat> Vancouver, who as I say was a rather impatient fellow, set out with the third lieutenant, Joseph Baker, uh, in two ships' boats. Uh, they actually uh, crossed uh, paths uh, in the night. Uh, Vancouver was camping on Ketron Island, um, uh, up uh, just north of the Nisqually Reach, and uh, Puget, who had been right out here and at the mouth of the, the Deschutes taking a, a sun sight on May 26th, was headed back to the ship. Um, Vancouver was coming south to look for him. <clears throat> they each thought the other was an Indian party, and so they didn't make contact. And then Vancouver, on May 27th, was also in the same spot, right out here at 47 degrees, three minutes north uh, latitude, uh, taking his sun sight. So we had two of the most well-known explorers in uh, maritime history right here in uh, what is now little old Olympia. Menzies uh, is famous in botany, of course, because uh, his is the uh, Latin name for the Douglas fir. Uh, David Douglas, who later came with the Hudson's Bay Company, was mentored by Menzies. Uh, and uh, they were, of course, both botanists. And uh, Menzies, uh, uh, the, the uh, Latin name is Sutasuga Menzii, or Menzies false hemlock. And that is the tree that we know as the Douglas fir. The Hudson's Bay Company was another uh, entity that was, uh, in a sense, exploring, although it was a commercial uh, endeavor, of course, uh, but very, very prominent in the uh, development of uh, trading posts and also uh, the development of relationships with the coastal Salish Indians here in the Pacific Northwest. They arrived in uh, uh, 1824, um, governor, uh, one of the governors of the Bay Company, Simpson, uh, sent an expedition north uh, under uh, James McMillan. And this gentleman, John Work, who was a fine Irish lad uh, from County uh, Tyrone, was the, one of the clerks uh, on that expedition. Uh, he later became a chief factor or director of one of the trading posts, several of the trading posts in the Pacific Northwest, uh, married an Indian woman and became one of the wealthiest uh, settlers uh, here. And of course the Hudson's Bay Company uh, treated the Indians with a great deal of respect and uh, uh, they were actually sort of a, a leavening force between the, uh, the American settlers who didn't respect the Indians quite as much as Hudson's Bay uh, and the Indians themselves. So uh, Wark uh, uh, <clears throat> managed to uh, train himself as uh, a self-taught botanist and he aided David Douglas when Douglas was here in the 10 years uh, he was here in collecting many of his specimens. The next expedition uh, of uh, Europeans or Americans was the Charles Wilkes expedition, the U.S. exploring expedition, and it was uh, uh, comprised of uh, uh, six ships actually, but two of them actually came to Puget Sound, and we see them here in a sketch by uh, the late Patrick Haskett, uh, an Olympia native who was a wonderful artist and also a good tugboat skipper. And uh, this is the, the brig porpoise and the sloop of war Vincennes, which was Charles Wilkes' uh, 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 flagship. 
uh, Wilkes uh, brought more scientists. You know, Vancouver had scientists with him. Obviously, we talked about David Douglas uh, of the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, also, William Tolmy, Tolmy State Park. Tolmy was a, a chief factor for Hudson's Bay at uh, the uh, uh, Fort Nisqually, uh, which was the trading post. So these scientists were collecting here. Wilkes brought 11 of them here. He referred to him as the scientifics, which is not a rock group. Uh, and uh, uh, they were uh, quite, uh, quite well known. And they were trying to put the US on the map as a country that was uh, uh, scientifically oriented, just as uh, Spain, France, and England were. And uh, this uh, next gentleman we'll see is uh, one of the scientists that was aboard. Uh, he was a, a linguist, a philo philologist from Harvard, Horatio Hale. Hale Passage is named for him. And he actually stayed on after Wilkes left uh, and wrote the definitive work on the culture and languages of, this, of the South Sound uh, coastal Salish Indians. So uh, it was quite an expedition for science and for exploring. Um, uh, part of the duties of Wilkes, uh, as he saw it, was to create an American presence in what is now the state of Washington, because at the time, this whole area was under a joint uh, uh, occupation treaty with Great Britain, and the border had not yet been drawn. So he wanted to give the negotiators, who negotiated later in 1846, uh, a leg up by placing 261 American place names in Puget Sound. He named them for his crew, uh, even the ones he didn't like, and there were a lot of them. Uh, he named them uh, for American naval battles, uh, American ships, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, he s actually set up an observatory up near what is now Chambers Bay Golf Course. Um, and uh, it was a uh, observatory that not only observed the heavens, but also uh, uh, set up a pendulum, uh, Boger's uh, process of measuring the thickness of the Earth's crust <clears throat> through the swinging of a pendulum. And uh, uh, that was what he was measuring. And you can see this uh, uh, plaque if you walk up the, uh, the trail alongside between uh, Chambers Bay Golf Course and, uh, and Puget Sound. Uh, you walk up about a mile from DuPont, and there it is, uh, still recording that uh, journey. Wilkes, uh, uh, as I say, was. Uh, uh, there were a lot of people he didn't like. Uh, a lot of people, his men, didn't like him. Uh, Murray Morgan, the Tacoma historian, once wrote that if Wilkes were God, many a saint would have fled heaven. <laughs> and now uh, John is going to tell you uh, a bit more about the development of Percival. One of my favorite stories that goes with Wilkes's uh, mapping of South Puget Sound is the way they measured distances is they would send a boat across to the other side of the sound uh, with a musket. And then at a given time, they would fire the musket off. Of course, they could see the flash, the speed of light. And then they would time it before they heard the boom of the musket. And that way, they measured distance, just like we today how f see a lightning flash and how far away was it, same, same principle. Olympia became uh, a big lumber port early on. Uh, at one point in the 1880s, there were 11 mills around Bud Inlet, uh, one of the many places Wilkes named, along with Eld and Totten down here. Um, and so this is a 1908 photo uh, taken roughly where the Port of Olympia's pier is today. But you can see the finished lumber stacked up being loaded aboard lumber schooners that called on Olympia. Uh, lumber from Puget Sound was exported all over the world, really. Of course, a lot of it went to San Francisco, which was booming, of course. Uh, 
Um, but it also went to Australia, which was growing. There was a big gold rush down in Australia. It also went to Japan, China, and even some to Europe. So trees uh, harvested here went all the way around the world. Olympia had several uh, shipbuilding industries too around uh, the 1880s. Uh, this is the Sloan Shipyard, uh, which is about where KGY radio station is today. Uh, and they built lumber schooners. You can see two large vessels under construction there. Uh, so a lot of the lumber schooners used in the lumber trade were built here on Puget Sound rather than someplace else because we had plenty of lumber. So uh, the Sloan Yard was in business for about 20 years. In the 1860s, Sam Percival came to Olympia. And one of the problems Olympia had is there's a lot of mud out there, as some of you may know. And only smaller vessels uh, could get into close into Olympia. And so Percival built a dock uh, there to service these smaller vessels, the Mosquito Fleet, which Les will tell you about in a minute. Uh, and this is probably his son's uh, in about 1880. But you can see it's, it's kind of, uh, it's got sales tickets. It's where the Mosquito Fleet boats docked. It's kind of like the inner city transit center downtown. It was a very busy, busy place. Now Les is going to talk about the Mosquito Fleet day. It was a wild old time. Uh, the, uh, the Mosquito Fleet uh, skippers uh, were a, uh, a very flamboyant uh, group. Uh, they, they made money for the people that employed them, uh, the, uh, the boat owners, by being famous and being so famous for their, their speed or their, uh, uh, their competitive nature that uh, uh, people would flock to their boat rather than another boat. So uh, there were hundreds of, of steamers. Uh, they were um, stern wheelers. Uh, they were propeller driven. Uh, they were uh, uh, side wheeler paddle boats. Uh, and they buzzed around the sound, hence the name Mosquito Fleet. And uh, of course, in those days, as John mentioned before, uh, the roads were not very good. In fact, they were just uh, trails, uh, unpaved. In the winter, they were almost impassable. And the fast way to move freight and passengers was not overland, but was uh, on Puget Sound. This was the superhighway Puget Sound uh, of uh, the time from 1850 to even up until the uh, 1920s. This is a photograph, uh, again, of uh, Percival Stock. Uh, the steamer Mizpah is the small uh, boat at the, uh, uh, at the right of the picture. And it was typical of uh, many of the small steamers in that uh, as the automobile was developed and roads were developed and then the demand for steamboats as passenger and freight carriers diminished, uh, many of these steamers were scrapped, of course, uh, but many others, like the Mizpah, were converted into tugboats because uh, the, uh, uh, the lumber industry was flourishing, and they needed a lot of tows, uh, and uh, sailing ships were uh, still very common, and particularly in South Sound, uh, uh, sailing ships needed, needed to be towed uh, in and the the tugboats would race out to uh, uh, see if they were the first one to get a line aboard. So the Mizpah uh, was a very typical. Uh, this is a larger uh, ship. This is the capital city named for our our fair capital here, uh, and 
We have, there is a photograph in the auditor's office of, uh, at the county courthouse of <clears throat> the capital city loading 300 passengers at Boston Harbor. Now remember, there was no Coast Guard in those days. The Coast Guard was four separate agencies at the time. Uh, there, was, uh, there were very few regulations. The skippers had to qualify uh, for a, a, a skipper's license, but there was no OSHA, there was no WISHA, uh, and uh, uh, so they would often crowd uh, more uh, passengers in them probably was safe and that was uh, one really good example of it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the capital city of course was a stern wheeler as is this boat, the uh, city of Aberdeen. Now I was mentioning how competitive the skippers were. This uh, boat was uh, captained by a man named John T. Schroll and his nickname was Hell Roaring Jack. Hell Roaring Jack never met a dock he couldn't destroy, <clears throat> and he never met a boat he didn't want to race. Now, you can see she's a stern wheeler as well. Uh, she was a fast one, but not the fastest on the sound. At the time uh, that uh, uh, Hell Roaring Jack was commanding, uh, that boat was the Greyhound, which was a propeller-driven, screw-driven uh, steamer. But he, he said to himself, there's got to be some way I can uh, beat the uh, Greyhound in a race, even if I have to cheat. And so one day they were coming into uh, Commencement Bay, and the city of Aberdeen was about 100 yards behind the Greyhound. The Greyhound wasn't paying any attention. There was no announcement of a race. She was slowing down uh, to dock there uh, down on what is now the, the uh, Foss Waterway. And Jack saw his chance. So <clears throat> he had his crew shove all of the cargo up into the bow, which lifted the stern wheel, allowed it to turn faster, and thereby increase the speed of the ship. Then, uh, uh, among his cargo was a load of bacon. And so he hollered down the voice pipe to the engineer, throw the bacon in the boiler furnace. And so he threw it in the boiler furnace. And of course, that raised the temperature uh, uh, of the boiler to a very dangerous level, uh, but more pressure and the wheel turned even faster. And so here was, uh, uh, the capital city making up that 100 yard uh, distance between them, puffing uh, bacon flavored smoke out the stack. <clears throat> and sure enough, he passed by and the, the, uh, the passengers cheered and uh, Tacoma smelled like bacon for a week. <clears throat> but uh, there's, there's another example of that uh, kind of uh, uh, competitiveness closer to home. Uh, there was a, uh, a boat uh, called, appropriately, the city of Shelton, which was on the Shelton to Olympia run. And its main competitor, it was a stern wheeler, and its main competitor was a propeller-driven craft called the Marianne. And they would race each other all the time. And the crew of the Marianne, which was a little bit faster, <clears throat> used to delight in calling uh, the city of Shelton old wet butt because, of course, the stern wheeler cranks up uh, a lot of water. And so they were racing down Hammersley Inlet one day, and uh, the Marianne was losing a little ground, and they were racing too fast, and they broke uh, their uh, propeller shaft. And so the, uh, 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 the city of Shelton towed her in to Olympia. Uh, the crew felt... Uh, that they were a little uh, treated ignominiously, but they all g gathered together at the Pine Tree Saloon uh, for a drink afterwards. Um, and uh, so that was the kind of competitiveness that, that you saw in the Mosquito Fleet in those days. Now this is the, another boat on the um, uh, Olympia Shelton Run, uh, named after the uh, lumber magnate uh, Sol G. Simpson. And it, and she was uh, 
again, a stern wheeler and uh, was probably the longest serving boat uh, on the Shelton Olympia run. Uh, the, uh, the navigators at that time were, were pretty uh, uh, innovative. Uh, there was one uh, uh, method of navigating called dog bark navigation. <clears throat> it was foggy in uh, uh, the channel, particularly if you were on the Olympia to Seattle run and you were going up West Passage or Colville's Passage and the fog would be thick, and uh, the skippers learned to distinguish among the various barks of the dogs on the farms along the shore. And so they could always, they could always uh, tell uh, where they were, uh, there were. And some people carried that to extremes, and John is gonna give you a, an example of that here in, in just a, uh, a minute, but uh, uh, that was it was quite an innovative innovative way to uh, uh, to navigate. Um, the uh, this boat is the Iola. <clears throat> she was a small steamer, obviously, and she was owned uh, at one time by a man named John Vanderhoof. And uh, you know you didn't make a lot of profit off this, and since he was the owner as well as the skipper, he he tried to keep the number of his crew uh, very low. And so it was John and his wife. Well, <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Vanderhoof had just served breakfast, and she was aft <clears throat> uh, uh, shaking out the tablecloth uh, over the transom when they hit a wake <clears throat> going up Colvo's Passage, and she fell overboard. Well, of course, the engine was running, and John was in the the pilot house and he couldn't hear anything and so he continued on up to Seattle when he noticed that Mrs. Vanderhoof was not aboard. <laughs> and so he, he turned around and came back but fortunately the gentleman who's pictured here in the bow whose name was Redding had a farm uh, on Colvo's Passage and when Mrs. Vanderhoof went overboard she was wearing the voluminous skirts of the time and they served as a flotation device, and she started screaming, and he heard the screams, and so he got in his skiff, and he rowed out, and he rescued her. Uh, and then uh, about three or four years later, Redding actually bought the boat from the Banderhoofs, and that's why he's, he's pictured here in the bow. But uh, uh, the, there were a hundred stories like that, <laughs> or more, uh, about these skippers. They were. Uh, they were quite a crew. John. Well, one dog bark navigator had bad luck in that uh, he trained his dog to, when he heard the, the boat coming back at night at the end of the day, to bark. So the, the, the dog's owner knew where to go. Uh, and so one day, the one night, the dog was out at the end of the little dock barking away, uh, except a rabbit ran by. So the dog took off down the beach chasing the rabbit, and uh, the boat ended up on the rocks. So, uh, so there's a lot of great stories uh, that come out of those days. One of my favorite is the stories less talked about the boats racing down the sound, and people would have their favorite skipper and get on that boat. It'd be like today, before you get on an airplane at SeaTac asking who the pilot is. Uh, but they did, and they were kind of well known, and so they had their their partisan passengers, if you will. So they go roaring down the sound, racing each other, passengers lining the the railings, yelling obscenities at each other, and there's even some unconfirmed stories of moonings going on uh, <laughs> as they went down. So those were fun days. Uh, in 1923, uh, the port of Olympia was created. The good citizens of Olympia decided that they needed uh, a better access to world markets. And so they formed the Port of Olympia and talked the Army Corps of Engineers into coming down and dredging out the harbor. Because uh, until then, ocean-going sized ships couldn't reach Olympia because of the mudflats. So uh, the port was created. And here you can see uh, the dock under construction with uh, 
what is uh, reputed to be the first ship to ocean-going ship to call it Olympia. Uh, you can see the dock still under construction. And then on her outboard side, you can see a raft with lumber. They're, they're loading lumber there. There's a lot of photos early days of the Olympia port. Uh, port of Olympia has a great collection, but uh, we've included this one because it kind of shows the, the full cycle of logs to finish lumber to being exported. So the, the lumber mill is to the right off the photo. With the, the thing that looks like a rocket sitting there is the slash burner. Uh, and then the mill is right off the scene to the right. And tugs would tow big rafts of logs and put them in a log pound like, like you see there. They'd be pulled into the mill, cut into finished lumber, which you can see stacked on the pier there and then loaded on ship for export. So this was a very common site uh, in the early 1900s in Olympia. And here we have the armored cruiser USS Olympia, which Les has spent a lot of time researching, so he's gonna tell you about this boat. Well, even though the protected cruiser USS Olympia never visited Olympia, uh, no, uh, no discussion of Olympia Maritime history is complete without uh, uh, telling you a little bit about her. She is uh, the oldest steel-hulled warship still afloat. Uh, she's a museum ship in Philadelphia uh, under the stewardship of the Independence Seaport uh, Museum. And uh, while she's rusting out uh, a bit and needs a, a, a $5 million new deck, <laughs> Uh, she's uh, still afloat, uh, still having visitors, and the docents are still uh, still very active uh, aboard her. She was uh, is known uh, in many circles as the Herald of Empire uh, because at the Battle of Manila Bay on May 1st, uh, 1898, uh, Admiral Dewey and his uh, uh, nine-ship squadron destroyed the Spanish fleet, and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the uh, United States at the end of the Spanish-American War gained a lot of uh, uh, possessions across the world. Uh, they needed them for coaling stations at the time, but uh, we gained uh, Hawaii, uh, which had uh, <coughs> uh, a, a group of American businessmen had deposed uh, the last Hawaiian monarch, uh, Queen Luliuokalani, uh, in uh, 1893, and by 1903 it had become a territory of uh, the United States. Uh, we gained Puerto Rico, uh, we gained Cuba for 20 years, the Philippines for 50 years, uh, Wake, Guam, uh, and a number of other uh, island spots in the Pacific. Samoa, for instance. So uh, it was indeed the beginning of the American century uh, and the expansion of the American fleet, and uh, the Olympia is a symbol of it. Uh, there's uh, one interesting story that involves uh, the man who used to live in this house. <clears throat> and uh, at the time, uh, it was common when uh, the Navy named a ship uh, for a uh, city, that the city or the state uh, would uh, contribute uh, a silver service or uh, some expensive token of their gratitude for being recognized by the Navy. Uh, that didn't happen uh, with the Olympia. We were in the middle of a depression when she was uh, uh, first uh, constructed in the early 1890s. And so uh, when she was invited after the battle, <clears throat> to uh, visit Olympia, uh, Dewey wrote a rather scathing letter uh, <laughs> uh, saying, you have uh, uh, undervalued my flagship. All the other ships uh, in my squadron have been recognized by their cities, but you haven't. So I'm, I'm not thinking of coming to Olympia very soon. Now, uh, fortunately, Leopold Schmidt uh, 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 
about six months earlier had uh, had sent um, six barrels of beer uh, to the Olympia, who that was uh, she was still in the Philippines uh, as a token uh, of the uh, state's uh, admiration for how well she had done, and Dewey was very very pleased about that. So. Uh, Leopold mitigated the uh, ire <laughs> of the great Admiral Dewey by, uh, by sending uh, the beer off to her. Uh, and uh, that's uh, one of these days. Uh, I'm uh, uh, part of an organization called the Washington State Friends of the USS Olympia. And uh, we have three purposes. One is to uh, raise money occasionally to help support the Philadelphia Museum and the ship. Uh, the second is to identify artifacts uh, from the battle that are present in the state. And so far, we've, uh, we've identified uh, 14 or 15 of those. And we're uh, in a program uh, to uh, establish plaques that explain the significance of the ship and her squadron in history and, uh, and where the, uh, the guns, in this case, are are from that we're at the battle. And the third is kind of to atone for not having done anything since we finally presented a, a silver service in 1900 uh, to the ship. That silver service, of course, is now in the governor's mansion here in Olympia. John. This is a photo from uh, this very building, not from the Olympia Tumwater Foundation's photo collection. Uh, in June of 1928, uh, Adolf Schmidt and some other uh, yachters decided to stage a race from Olympia to Juneau called the Capital to Capital Race. And so 10 boats finally showed up at the starting line. Here's the, the start of the race up to Juneau. And it wasn't a speed race, it was a predicted log race, which means the first boat to finish doesn't necessarily win. It's whatever boat arrives closest to the time predicted by the skipper. It would take them to reach it. Uh, but uh, you can see here the, the classic old lines of, of the boats. This is an Italian cruise liner that uh, visited Olympia in the 1930s. Um, and you can see all the cars and all the people. It was quite a tourist site. People came from miles around to see this ship. Um, a lot of cargo ships came to Olympia, mainly for lumber, but it was pretty unusual to see a cruise boat here. Um, and, but I'm told this summer, the smaller cruise boats coming to Olympia is maybe part of a, a long-term arrangement for that. So this is the frigate USS Constitution, which was out here in Bud Inlet in June of 1933. The Constitution gained its fame during the War of 1812 uh, when the British nicknamed it Old Ironsides because their cannonballs just bounced off her side. Uh, and she today is the oldest commissioned warship in the US Navy uh, in Boston. But she was here in Olympia as part of a goodwill tour around the country. In the late 20s, she was in pretty sad conditions, needed a major refit. But we were entering into the Depression. The government didn't have a lot of extra money. So they started a public fundraising campaign. And it became kind of famous because thousands of school kids emptied their piggy banks to uh, help fund the restoration of the Constitution. So as a thank you, uh, the government towed her down the East Coast to d several ports through the Panama Canal, which was open by then, and then up the West Coast and right here in Bud Inlet for a while. Another warship that visited Olympia is the USS Oregon, which was here right after World War I with Woodrow Wilson aboard, who came uh, to visit the governor. Um, it wasn't unusual for the Pacific Fleet, our Navy's Pacific Fleet, to make annual visits to uh, Puget Sound, uh, mainly 
anchored up in Seattle or Tacoma, but on this occasion, uh, they made the trip down to Olympia so the president could visit. Uh, roads still weren't that good in those days. Here's another early warship, the USS West Virginia, and she was never in Olympia. She, this shows her, uh, she was part of the fleet that anchored in Tacoma in the late 1930s, and why she's pictured here is part of her crew came down here and played St. Martin's College baseball team. Uh, and, but I wasn't able to find out who won the game, but uh, that was kind of interesting. They came all this way to play a baseball game. After World War II, the Navy had thousands of ships that had no use for anymore. Many of them were scrapped, but the Navy decided to keep some of them in what they called reserve fleets around the country. And some of you long-timers here in Olympia will remember that there was a, a reserve fleet of cargo vessels out further out in Bud Inlet for many, many years. Um, this shows the offices. They kept them uh, ready to go. And so after uh, the war, then for the Korean War, uh, a number of them were uh, put back in service to transport troops and cargo to Korea. A number were activated during the Suez crisis, and even uh, the early days of the Vietnam War, a number of them were put back in service to, again, transport troops and cargo. But by the early 70s, it had all been towed away for scrap, and today there's uh, nothing left of that. I'm sure you all recognize the Tug Sandman, which is our iconic, iconic tug down by the Oyster House. Um, here she is in 1911. She was built in 1908 by a man named Arthur Weston. And he was visiting the Alaska Yukon Exposition up in Seattle, where the UW campus is today. And he was in the Hall of Industry, and he saw a brand new marine engine called the Frisco Standard and decided he just had to have it for his tugboat. So he bought it on the spot. He couldn't take it away until after the exposition was over. But then he took it down to Olympia to the Crawford and Reed shipyard, which built the Sandman. The Crawford and Reed shipyard was famous probably for building some of the fastest of the Mosquito Fleet steamers. If your boat got beaten by another boat, you would come to Crawford and Reed to build a faster boat for you. Uh, but they built the, the Tug Sandman as well as several other tugs. Uh, you can see in the foreground a railroad trestle, which was part of the Northern Pacific's main line into Tacoma. And that part of the track was on a, a trestle. You could rotate it. So when they were ready to launch a vessel, they would rotate the track out of the way, slide the vessel into the water, and put the track back. And I assume they checked the train schedule before they did that, because uh, there's no reports of trains going off the rail. But that was kind of an interesting part of their little business. And here's the Tug Sandman today. Um, one of the things she's noted for is you can see what's called a wine glass stern. Uh, this was not a usual tugboat design. Tugboats were very utilitarian and, and designed to be work boats, but uh, the Sandman has a very pretty hull that's kind of unusual for tugboats. But when you see her down there, she's an iconic piece of Olympia maritime history going back to 1908. This is a picture of the Nippon Maru. We were talking earlier about the organ coming down here because Woodrow Wilson was aboard for Fleet Week in Seattle, and he felt constrained to pay the courtesy call on the governor. Um, in uh, 1989, it was our centennial year, and I was uh, privileged to chair the Maritime Committee of the State Centennial Commission. <clears throat> we uh, decided we couldn't, have, we had a low budget, and we couldn't afford a tall ship's event. So I uh, uh, went to Ralph Monroe and uh, uh, Gene Gardner, who were the co-chairs, and they said, well, why don't we just invite 
all the tall ships on the Pacific Rim and see if any of them come, and and uh, it won't cost us anything, and uh, um, we'll have uh, uh, ships to uh, show to the public. So we did. Uh, naively, we invited even the Chilean uh, tall ship, which is uh, the uh, Esmeralda, uh, which was uh, Pinochet's torture ship for the Allende group. <laughs> that, that wasn't too successful. Uh, but uh, uh, they did come because they hadn't been invited anywhere in 20 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, and as they, they steamed into Seattle, Ralph and I were on the dock, and uh, you know the cadets were manning the yards and singing Chilean sea shanties in eight-part harmony, and we noticed that there was a crowd of people at the end of Pier 70 with bullhorns chanting, Chile si, junta no. <laughs> so Ralph said, let's move the ceremony inside. <laughs> but this was the successful visit of the tall ship, uh, this is the Nippon Maru, which is the Japanese sail training vessel. Uh, and it came all the way down here to play, to pay a visit to the governor, bless, his, bless their hearts. And uh, uh, Karen Fraser's uh, adopted daughter, uh, uh, Mayumi uh, T Takeno, uh, uh, was our translator. And uh, so um, we... Uh, uh, the captain wanted to pay the call. Uh, the protocol officer for the state at the time was Bill Asbury, and he had briefed Governor Gardner very well, fortunately. So the captain is in his dress whites and with his ceremonial sword, and I escort him uh, uh, up to uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the governor's office, and we walk in, and. Here is Booth, who is just turning 50, in an old sweatshirt that says, 50 ain't old if you're a tree. <laughs> and here was the skipper in his dress whites. And, but, you know, uh, you know Booth Gardner in two minutes. Um, uh, Bill Asbury had, had talked to him about the hometown of the, the captain of the ship. He went to the Globe in the governor's office, pinpointed the town, was quizzing the, uh, the skipper on what it was like to grow up there in Japan, and he had him uh, charm the socks off him in about two minutes. <laughs> this is the submarine USS Olympia, named after our fair city, uh, paid a port call here in the 1990s. Uh, she's based in Honolulu and is technically a uh, Los Angeles class attack submarine. Um, you may have read in the paper too, they just uh, about nine months ago launched a new submarine, uh, the USS Washington. Well, the Port of Olympia, when the shift was made to containerization for ocean cargoes, Seattle and Tacoma geared up, uh, but Olympia chose to focus on what they call break cargo, things that don't go into containers. So here we have some stevedores loading logs. You can see the yacht club in the background there. I kind of like this picture. They're unloading a new uh, big mobile crane with a big Manson crane that was towed down from Seattle for the job. This is a trimaran that was built in Hong Kong and then brought over here on a ship for its owner to pick up. And here's the modern port of Olympia. The ship you can see there, you can see a little metal thing on its stern. It's a row row ship, they call it roll on, roll off, where you can drive, they lower that onto the pier and then they can drive vehicles off and on. Uh, the ship. Well, as you can see, we have a wonderful maritime heritage here in uh, Thurston County. How do we celebrate it? Well, we celebrate it with uh, uh, an annual Harbor Days event every Labor Day weekend. This is a, a photo of the, the Sandman in, uh, in one of the typical uh, tugboat races. 
that's uh, held uh, uh, every Sunday before Labor Day. And uh, we, uh, uh, we hope that you uh, will consider joining us for the 45th anniversary uh, next year. Uh, we, we also intend to celebrate the survivors of the Mosquito Fleet. Uh, here's the Virginia Five, which is one of those. Uh, there's another one that is based in, in uh, Olympia uh, called the Terry Knot Two, uh, and uh, she uh, was associated with Sea Blossom Foods, uh, and uh, she has visited many times. And the third one is the Carlisle Two, which is the uh, passenger tug that runs between uh, Polesbo and Port Orchard and is owned by Kitsap County. So we hope to gather the three of them together uh, for the visit also. We frequently attract uh, uh, two uh, sailing ships, the uh, uh, Lady Washington and the Hawaiian Chieftain from the Grace Harbor uh, Seaport Museum. So please join us. Uh, we've enjoyed talking to you, uh, and uh, we've enjoyed all the help we've gotten from the Olympia Tumwater Foundation uh, in the publication of our book and in uh, our quest for uh, more good stories about maritime history in general. Thank you. <laughs>